Okay. So you ready to go to Flickr? Yeah, let's do let's Flickr because I, I already I was peeking over my shoulder and I was going, oh, let's get to the Flickr thing. This is awesome. Okay, um, let's see this print, this picture. Okay, summer pool. Um, okay, where is the main light coming from? It's coming from underneath, and we've been talking about that. That that's not a real flattering angle. I love, love, love the concept, though. I think this photographer's got a quirky attitude and a kind of a quirky style, and I like the idea of photographing from up above the subject. But this is not executed well. This one, this one falls short, and you need a little bit of work. First of all, because you're photographing straight down on her and the main light is coming from underneath, it's creating a bit of unflattering light in the eyes. And it's, it's just not, it's more, this is what's called ghoul light when you light from underneath. Um, second of all, we're cutting off the arms a bit. And because we're photograph we've cut off the legs at kind of a heavy point in the leg, in the thigh, it makes her thighs look a bit heavy. So I would like to see uh, the maker um, recreate this picture. And um, I, I, what I do like, by the way, I just noticed that she, this friend wanted a new profile picture for Facebook. And it is quirky. For Facebook, I think this would be highly appropriate. It's kind of fun and quirky. But if you want to really flatter the subject, then I would recommend um, doing the S curve. In other words, if you've got her sitting in the pool, she can still sit on her thigh, and she can rotate one direction, and then turn her face and look up at you. Um, if you need to flash fill her a little bit to fill in the eyes from a higher camera angle, then that's what I would do. OK, um, love the light on this little boy's head, face. Love the expression on his face. It is absolutely adorable. I think he's got a very, very sweet look on his face. Um, I would like to see you move the subject away from the background just a little bit. Um, but overall, I think this is a very, very pleasing little picture. Very nice. OK, which one of these two subjects is closer to the light source? The man. The bride. Yeah, you can tell. OK, so where is the main light? Well, actually, the light's coming from, it looks like from behind her. It's actually coming from behind them. And, and I think what's really fooling us is the treatment on this picture. You know, there's the treatment. And, and sometimes with the treatment, it can kind of blow out the highlights a little bit. Um, I like a number of things about this photograph. I like the, the tilt of her is very nice. The way that she's got her head tilted into him, I think, is very pleasing. Um, he is not looking quite as believable to me. Because, and it's because he's basically sitting up fairly straight with his head tilted towards her. So I'd like to see a bit more tilt into her. But overall, I think it's a very sweet picture. I had a sort of the, the groom is, is closer to us. It, it looks like it makes him a little bit bigger. Yes, he is bigger. No, I don't have a problem with him being closer to the lens than her. I, that doesn't bother me at all. In fact, if anything, I think it's a help because she is a tinier girl, and I think that it makes her look a little bit more vulnerable. It's just very sweet. That doesn't bother me at all. Um, by the way, this is a great, him, his picture, I would have gone in and liquefied his chin a little bit and just pulled it right on up, just a tiny bit. Okay. Okay, where is the main light coming from in this picture? Right in front. And especially if you're trying to show the shape of a belly, that light should be where? The main light should be on the right-hand side, crossing her tummy, because then it's going to show the shape of her belly more. It's going to give her belly round. Uh, it's going to show it as a little bit rounder. As it is, it just looks a little bit flat. It's a flat object. Um, the other thing is, is that her, um, she's standing flat-footed. And I can tell, because you could draw a straight line from the top of her head down to her feet. I love, love, love belly pictures. I think they're really a lot of fun to do. Um, but I'd like to see the maker. I want you to do this for me. This is your homework assignment, James. I want you to move that light source around to the right-hand side, and I want you to redo something like this for me and email me a picture. OK, um, this is actually quite a pretty photograph. Um, I'm wondering why that kink is in the curtain right there. It kind of pulls my eye away because it is so close to her face. Um, but the, the, one of the, the thing that would soften this image up a little bit, I think she's got a very, very sweet look on her face. I do like the camera position in relation uh, to the light source. You see, because you can really see that beautiful soft um, cheekbone. She's got a very pretty cheek line. When you have somebody looking straight away like that, this, by the way, is a good profile. You know how I can tell? Because look, we can see the eyelash on the back eye, but not the eyeball on the back eye. I would like to have seen, the, the only thing I would have liked to have seen the maker do is just slightly tilt the top of the bride's head 
towards the camera because it softens that look. It just looks a little bit more believable. But still a very nice picture. Uh, okay, this is very, very flatly lit, but flat light, as we've learned today, can be very, very flattering. Um, the, the kicker light, the kicker light that they're using to accent the hair is a little bit too bright. So you need to skim that light and feather that light a bit um, back away from us or towards the camera and use a, a bit of a gobo so it doesn't you know, come into the lens. But it's a little bit too bright on her hair. And I can tell because when you squint, that's the first thing I see is that, that hair light. But still, very, very nice, uh, nice portrait in the front, a very pretty picture of this beautiful girl. Adorable. I love it. I love everything about this picture. Now, it's imperfect, isn't it? There's some, there's, it's imperfect, but I really, really like this picture a lot. This is, this is a good example of editorial photography. Because editorial photography, I mean, his arm, you can't see his hand, his arm's kind of cut off there on the bottom. Um, but it's working for me because the treatment, the lighting all fit the subject. It all fits the, the scenario. And they look, it looks believable to me, the connection between the two people. Editorial photography does not always have to be so perfect. It's just, in other words, you can fudge a bit with editorial work. Um, I think this is a, a nice, quirky little picture. Um, I, the only thing I would like to see is I'd like to see a little bit more of a laugh from her, I think. But still nice, not bad. OK, um, let's see. She's facing pretty much straight into the camera, except her head is turned. You see, this is what she's doing, I think. See, it looks to me like she's got her head turned a bit too much. So what I would recommend doing is, first of all, if you dropped that shoulder, this shoulder, if her, she's going to look away, if you drop that shoulder a little bit, it's going to look a little bit more believable. No, towards. You know, in other words, I would just I would have just dipped her this way. You know, she could have dipped away from me, you know, like just sideways like this. It would have softened it up a little bit, but I would still want her face turned a little bit more towards me because I feel she, uh, her shoulders are too this way, and then she's turning her head a little bit too much. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Um, where is the flash in this photograph coming from? Okay, it's right on, it's very, very hard light. Would you agree that this is a small light source, right? First of all, the maker gets an A plus for expression. Fantastic expression. It is so hard, it's so much harder to get a great expression than it is to light the picture. The, you got the, the hard part down. You're doing a great job, the maker's doing a really good job with the hard part. Now I need to see you, let's, let's, let's finesse this picture and light it properly. There are a couple of ways that the, the maker could have lit this picture to get a better picture. Michael, how would she have done that, or he had done that? Um, I think I would have put the light source uh, camera right, because uh, you're... So in other words, over here? Yeah. OK, that's one thing you could do. What else? Um, a little bit. Oh, you got a mic. OK, uh -huh. what is another thing you could have done? OK, what if you, would this not be a good opportunity if you had the, if the ability to turn your flash if you had a flash on your camera, because it looks like the flash is on the camera, mm -hmm. instead of turning the flash towards the subject, if there was a light colored wall behind you over your shoulder to the right, would that not have been nice? Yeah. That would be good. So that would be a nice thing, because um, so, otherwise, I think you're on the right track. You just need to learn to work with your light in a little bit better way and not use that hard light source on her, because it's a little bit overexposed. And it's um, overpowering the subject, and, and it's kind of um, producing a, a, a little bit too sharp of a light on her body, on her Bambi, face. Bambi, you've mentioned a couple times bouncing off the wall, just like yes. now. When's, when are you too far away from the wall to, to be able to effectively bounce it in TTL? Um, I haven't found that point yet where you're too far. Um, it's, you, if the farther you are from your wall, you're going to need a higher ISO. Um, I have found like that, you know, wh how far is this room? 40 feet? Easy, 20, 20 40 feet? You would need, I would just say practice that, and the farther you are from the wall, just need, you need to increase your ISO a bit to compensate for that. Use a shallow depth of field. Um, but, but if you're at 10 or 15 feet, you are in the zone. It is really okay. easy. And that's what I would be looking for. If I only had a flash on my camera, if that's what I had to use, and I would be walking in the room, the, what I would look for in a room to get my pictures, I would be looking for a white wall. That's exactly what I'd do. I'd say, I don't care. I want a neutral background. Find me a white wall. So if, for instance, if I had to do pictures and I needed 
I didn't have pretty natural light. I didn't have fancy lights. All I had to work with, and it was pouring down rain outside, was this room exactly as it is right now. I can promise you that is my bouncing off the wall. And then my background is going to be probably where you all are at or maybe in this direction right here and use the brick as my background. So, Because, again, I'm always thinking in plan, what's my plan of action if this is what I have to have? Okay, let's go forward. Okay, I love the idea. I'm not crazy about the follow through. Why is it not? Why is it falling short here? Um, yes, because she's faced squarely into the. I mean, she's tiny, so there's that. But um, maybe if her hips had been turned one way or the other. Well, see, and I, I got to tell you, this picture's close. It's actually close, and I bet you that it's not quite as overexposed as it's, it's as it looks like it is on the screen. I bet you anything. This is. Probably a pretty nice looking image. I like this picture. I think it's actually a beautiful picture. What, I'm, what is um, bothering me is that there's no room for her eyes to move. She is square into the camera. See, she's right in the middle. So there's not a lot of room for her eyes to, for her, for her eyes to go. It kind of goes right off the page. So I would actually, I think the pose is actually quite pretty. And in her case, she's one of the few people who can actually be right in front of the camera with, uh, you know, facing straight into the camera and get away with it because she's a very slender girl and because she's got tiny arms, she can cross her arms across her, her waist and get away with it. It's, it's okay for this young lady. But I just would like to have a tiny bit more room for her eyes. But still, it's very graceful. And I like the fact the pose fits the environment. The dress fits the environment. And you see how important that is when you have um, a garment, when, you ha when you're posing your subjects, you want to think about... What kind of environment does this does it fight against the subject, or does it work with it? You know, if you have a bride who's wearing this beautiful romantic ball gown and you're trying to get her all vogue against the brick wall, I'm like, what? It doesn't work. It just feels uncomfortable. It feels like, huh? It doesn't belong there. Um, let's go forward. That to me is the picture of the day. That's absolutely beautiful. Um, what do I? What is not to like about this photograph? It is flatly lit. But you know what? Again, flat light is flattering. Um, th this maker has done a very lovely job with this image. Um, the child has a very engaging expression on her face or on his face. I don't, can't tell if it's a beautiful little boy or a gorgeous little girl, but cute as pie anyway. Oh, Angie. Well, no, but it's by Angie again. Um, beautiful, beautiful picture of the face. I love the soft light. I love the soft tonality all the way around. The background is not dark, is not too dark in relation to the clothing. It works in harmony to me. And the, uh, even her eyes are in harmony with the environment. The shallow depth of field, there is no question as to where my, my eyes go. My eye goes right to that kid's eyes first, and, and it settles there. Even though she, they're wearing, she's wearing, the, or he's wearing this little white outfit, I would think usually my eye would be pulled down to that area. But because the eyes are so engaging and the, the expression is such a sweet little uh, expression and it's such a beautiful child to begin with, um, I feel that it's working in a very pleasant way. Very nicely done. Uh, adorable. I think this is very cute. The only thing is, is that it looks a little bit overexposed. And, and I can't tell, and, and I'll cut you some slack maker if, you, if it's not overexposed. I, I love the, um, the composition. I think it's quirky. I love pictures of little kids when you, when you put them in, in this kind of, um, it's just kind of fun and, fun and kicky looking. I think it's just very cute. Um, the light in the eyes looks, looks nice. The background does, it's a high key image. The background does look white, but it does look a little tiny bit overexposed. But, but it's still a nice effort. Okay, um, this, this is um, obviously the maker did this on purpose. They've, um, they've increased the contrast just so this little girl's eyes show up. Um, from a technical standpoint, this would probably not be an image that would do well in competition for a variety of reasons. Um, but from the standpoint of just an image that has some impact, it has impact to me. Uh, my eye goes right to that little girl's face. Um, what is pulling me away from her, however, are, is that the, the, her hair on the left-hand side is so blown out. I'd like to see a bit more detail in the mother's eyelashes in that kind of portion of the mom's face. Um, but still, I, I think it's an interesting picture. Um, it's got a little bit of pizzazz. I think it's just very cute. OK, by the way, this is clamshell lighting. How do I know? Catch lights. <laughs> yeah, look at the catch lights. This is a very pretty portrait of this woman. Um, the light, um, I love the soft light that's being used on her. 
I love the positioning of the hands, very, very lovely. The higher light source causes those cheekbones to pop, and the maker has done a nice job of lighting it. Uh, the, the, the light on the forehead seems to be a tiny bit, looks a little bit overexposed, but as I said, I, I'm not going to fault you too much for that because I don't know if it's this monitor or not. Very pretty pose, beautifully, beautifully done. Okay, where's the main light? Down below, stay away from the ghoul light. Stay away from ghoul light. Don't light from underneath. It's unnatural looking, and it doesn't look, it doesn't look pretty. It's just not a very pretty look. And the other thing about this pose is you're overdoing the pose. Whenever you're posing your subjects, it's just tiny nuances of, of barely tilting or uh, tilting the head or moving the shoulders. You don't, you don't need to overdo it. Don't get too carried away. And with her, you can tell that she's just really exaggerating her, her neck, uh, her, her head is tilted to a very exaggerated degree, and so it doesn't feel believable. Do we have any questions, by the way, from, our, from the people out there? I was told by Celeste that we're going to do about 30 minutes of Q&A. Oh, so great. Okay, good. So after, after we do the critique. So okay, great. Do that. Okay. Um, okay, so um, I need somebody else to critique this image for me. Who wants to do it? Linda, do you want to critique this? Already from what we've talked about. <laughs> Okay. Whole, what uh, else? A lot of contrast in some compared to the couple. Oops. Okay, you want to repeat that again? Oh, it seems like the background's competing with what's going on with the couple because uh, the contrast is kind of the same. Okay, anyone else have a comment? Michael, you always have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first thing I notice is the composition. Um, I think I like the trees, um, and I, I think they kind of um, go down the perspective, and I think if they were more to the right of that, that would be kind of cool. You know what, and I agree with you. See, it, I think the trees are actually, the way that they've, they, I like the idea of the trees, but I don't like the composition because they are too centered in the picture. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is, is that we needed to hide her outfit. This gal, all I see, my eye keeps going from her face down to her dress. I can't get past her dress because it just keeps pulling me away. So how would you, okay, so this client wore that outfit. What could we do to minimize that, to fix it? How do we fix that? I mean, that's what she wore. So what do you do? Well, you could crop it. You certainly could crop it. But there, even full length or a three-quarter length like this, you could, there's still something you could do. There you go. That's it. In other words, let's hide her a little bit so that we're not seeing so much of that dress. Because, see, we see so much of her garment that it's hard for us to get up to the face to see the two of them. So I would probably have turned them a bit more so that and, and hidden a portion of her shape behind him, maybe had her standing, for instance. Um, come here, Michael. I need to demonstrate this. Okay, come right over here in front of me and turn towards me this way. Turn towards me all the way, right face me, right here. Face me. Which means you okay. So if this is your couple, I'm gonna have, okay, I want you to lean into that hip right there a little bit. Or actually let me lean towards me this way. Okay, now watch what happens. See, I could go like this. Look at me this way with your face. See, now we're still engaged together. We still are engaged this way. But now how much of my shape can you see? So if I had that big skirt on or that, that skirt that's so big, you see how you're not seeing so much of it anymore? Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, good job. Okay. Okay, shut your eyes and squint for a second. What do you start seeing? What's bigger than her face? I'd see her forehead. Okay. And true. her cheeks. But um, I mean, but forget her face. Look at that. Look at her arm. shoulder right here. See, because she's rolling it forward. Mm -hmm. That is really, really, really important. Is you don't want to roll that shoulder forward too much. It's, it's, it's the rolling of the shoulder in relation to the camera angle. Because, you know, we've, we've done a lot of that rolling of the shoulder forward this week. We can do that. It's just that when you roll it forward and you have a higher camera angle, there you're asking for trouble. You see, higher camera angle, I can see the back side of my shoulder or I can see too much of it, and it starts competing with the face. I think it's a very sexy expression on the young woman's face, and I love the way that, um, I think if they cropped that out, to be honest with you, that's a beautiful picture. See, if you just go like that and crop that arm out, to me, I would put the, the this, this is where I would crop it. Like, it's right about there, right in there. Because it's actually quite a pretty picture, very, very pretty look on the young lady's face. 
Um, I just get, can't get past the shoulder. It's kind of get, it, it's, it's a little bit of a distraction to me. Okay, I think that was the last critique we had for today. I want to say thank you to all of you out there who gave us images today for critique. I hope you found the critiques helpful. Um, I, I really try to make them as positive and informative as possible. By the way, I do critiques on my, web, on my personal blog every single week on Mondays and Fridays. And if you would like to have your images critiqued, you're welcome to send me an image at Bambi at CantrellPortrait.com and I'm more than happy to uh, critique those images for you. It may take me a while because we do them only Monday and Fridays, but I do critique every image. They are up there for the world to see, so you have to be willing to let the world see your pictures. But you know, I gotta tell you, we don't learn from the things we do right, we learn from our mistakes, and I hope that you'll feel that it's a very positive experience and that um, it's one that you would like to share in. So thank you very much for those that shared today. From the response in the chat room, they love watching the critiques. Great. Really, really enjoy that part, so. Thank you for that. All right, you ready to do some Q&A, Bambi? Yeah, let's do some Q&A. All right. We have a question from Maeve. Um, can we discuss how you shoot a bride with darker skin tones in a sea of multiple skin tones or with a light skin groom? Um, we talked about that earlier this morning. Um, the, the, the key to working with, with multiple, uh, with different skin tonalities is you just have to understand what is it that gives each of them their dimensionality. Um, if I'm going to work with somebody with darker skin tone, one time I worked with a, a couple, the bride was from um, Sweden and the groom was from Ethiopia and he was extremely dark skin. His skin was probably as dark as my jacket, very, very dark skin man. And she was, she had no pigment. I mean, she was just almost translucent. She was very, very light skinned. But in working with them, it's not about the quantity of light that you use on each of those types of individuals. And when you photograph them together, you just have to understand what is it that gives their skin dimensionality. And on darker skin, what makes this, you understand that there, this has texture, are the highlights, not the shadows. And on the lighter skin tone person, it's the shadow areas. So what I would do if I were photographing people of multiple or in varying degrees of tonality, um, I would use a, um, a, a, um, a reflector with a silver side um, to illuminate someone with darker skin and I would put I would make sure that I lit that skin with that silver side and it would create nice a nice little specular that separates that skin tone or that, that just highlights that skin rather and that's how I would do that okay okay next is um, from Brittany Ray and she said that she has had a couple of boudoir clients ask her this and that it seems like a sensitive issue and her question is what is Bambi's response to the client that wants to know how much retouching or liquefying was done to their image? Because I know you say you don't overdo it, right. but what if they ask you? I would just, this is exactly what I would say to them. I would say, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> That's exactly, I would say there are certain, I don't tell people, I mean, first of all, I have to tell you, in all of my years, I have never had a client ask me how much retouching I've done on them. I just say, well, let me, I, then I would turn the question around and say, how much do you think was done? Because think about it, if they say a lot of retouching, then guess what are they saying to you? You know, well, man, you really worked me over good. And then I would say, but well, was it a pleasant experience? You know, I, you know sometimes this is, you know, we, we try to tell people too much. You know, why do we feel we have to tell them the history of the universe? We don't need to tell them every little thing about our businesses. You know, what is the deal with that? It's like sometimes we feel like we have to justify our pricing. And sometimes people will say, well, maybe how come you're so expensive? And I say, because I can because I can charge what I want. This is my profession. And, and it's because I'm that good. And I look them right in the eye, and even if I don't feel that I'm that good, I go, it's because I'm very talented. And it's because it's, I can charge that much. You know, and, and I think that sometimes we start, we start trying to justify everything we want to do and, and have to make these long explanations when in reality, would we do that at Nordstrom's? Would we say to our attorney, uh, well, you know, why do you charge what you do? You know, we don't say we don't ask people th things like that. Only people ask photographers for that. And when people ask me for a discount and a deal, I'm going to tell you right now. You want to learn these words. First of all, I say I wish I could. And then I actually, this is exactly what I say to a client when they ask me for a deal. I say, um, absolutely, I will absolutely give you a deal, but and I'll give you half price, but only if you let me work half as hard. That's exactly what I would say. If I can work half as hard, absolutely. And, they're, and I'm joking, because I don't do gis, discounts of any kind. I do not do deals at all. And, 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 I, and then this is the next thing I say. I said, have you ever given thought 
that maybe it is in your best interest to pay more to hire me. Now, how could it possibly be in the client's best interest to pay more to hire you? I think that's the way we have to look at things sometimes, is that maybe, you know, you know, how could it be in their best interest? Well, how about this? Let's say you get up on that Saturday morning and you don't feel well, or you know, you know, you've had a death in your family and you still have to show up. Think about that. You know, the person who's not very well compensated for their talent, how do you think they feel if they get up and they've got a cold? Well, they may not show up. I'm really well paid to get my butt out of bed on a Saturday. What do you think the odds are of me showing up? I'm going to be there because I'm being paid really well and I know I'd have to give that money back and I don't want to do that. So I really believe that sometimes we just let people be in charge too much of our business. And I do not allow clients to dictate my company policy, absolutely never. And once you let them dictate your company policy, it's over. They own you and they start running your business and telling you how to run your business. And I refuse to have that. And it's only because I've done it the other way. I'm the old lady, I told you, I've, done, I've made all the mistakes for you. And um, I have absolutely made this one when I have allowed clients to tell me when they would pay me. And I no longer ever allow that because the one time I did, hey, guess what? You know, uh, can I pay you after the event is taken? Yeah, well, I guess so. Well, you know, okay, can I do this? And then they start, they got your, their foot in the door, so now all of a sudden everything in the universe are going to ask you for all kinds of things. So I have learned um, the way that I, for weddings specifically, uh, my weddings are paid in full before the day of the wedding, period. I do not negotiate when that is paid. It is paid beforehand. Th the first third is paid to retain my services. The second payment is due 90 days before the wedding. And the last payment is paid the week before the event. And if they say, well, well, well what if I, you know, how do I know you're going to even do the job? Well, first of all, they would not be hiring me if they questioned my credentials and my ability to do that. And if they do have a problem with that and question that, then you know what? Then that's probably not a good client for me. And um, so, you know, I really believe that, that it's important for all of us as photographers, as business people, to not allow people to dictate our business policies. And you wouldn't do that with your attorney, and you wouldn't even go to Nordstrom's and say, well, you know, I don't know if I want to pay you this. You know, I, we just aren't going to do that. Gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> exactly. I think we have a question in the audience. Oh, yes. How far along in your career as a photographer were you when you decided to take the hard-nosed line on, I'm not giving any discounts and I'm not letting anybody dictate my business? I mean, not that I don't, I agree with it 100%, uh -huh. but how far along were you when you finally had enough and you said, this is what I want to do? Um, it took me about five years into my career, but it doesn't have to take you guys that long. No, See, I no. learned, I mean, it took me a long time, and, and it's only because, I mean, I was just dumb. I just was trying to be a nice person, and because I didn't value my own work. Because, you know, we, we're artists. We don't want to be, we don't want to talk about money anyway. We don't want to do that. We don't like that. And it finally, I just finally, thank goodness, I finally grew up and realized that every single time I did that, where I gave a deal or I did somebody a favor or whatever, it came and bit me on the butt. And let me give you a little story behind that. A number of years ago, I had the opportunity to, um, I was called by one of the radio stations. They said, hey, we've got this bride who's, um, we're going to do a giveaway. We're going to do a, put on a whole wedding, and we'd love for you to be the photographer. Would you give us your services? So I said, well, you know, this might be really good. I have my name on, you know, it'll be in the newspaper, and, and it'll be on the radio station and everything. And so I, um, I gave them a, an entire, a full wedding coverage, which was at the time was around $10,000. And so I, um, so the week before the wedding, I called the bride. And I said, oh, I said, I'm so excited about your wedding. You know, I'd love for you to be at the, um, it was going to be a garden wedding. If you could be there like an hour beforehand, I'd love to get pictures of you, you know, uh, some beautiful pictures of you before the wedding. And, and you know, we get a chance to, to work together before the ceremony. And so she goes, oh, okay. And so the day of the wedding rolls around. I go to the, I'm at the, the garden site for the, for the ceremony. Um, and the ceremony was at 2 o'clock. I'm there at 1 o'clock, 1 o'clock, no bride, 1.30, no bride, 1.45, no bride, 1.50. The bride flies in by the seat of her pants. She literally had sweat running down her face. She was, um, she was a gal who really needed my attention. She was somebody who was going to need, she was going to need a lot, you know, I was going to need to be able to work with her a little bit. And because she did not pay for that wedding, because nothing was paid for, how much value do you think that wedding was to her and her husband? It was a big fat zero. 
Neither one of them cared about it because they didn't put out a dime to, for it to happen. And so they did not care one bit about the entire day. They did not show any appreciation. It was a huge waste of time. And it was not, it was not a positive experience in any form or fashion. And so I have learned, in fact, every single time I have done a freebie, and I used to do two charity weddings every year, I have learned the hard way that when people don't pay for something and make it hurt a little, if it doesn't hurt, then it has no value. And if they don't value your services, then guess what? You are a servant and you are treated accordingly. And the lower the, the wedding, the amount of the priority of photography, the, the lower on the totem pole you are, the less that they, um, they listen to you. They are always late because there's no value. In fact, speaking about being late, um, for those of you that charge, if you have like overtime fees, if I did overtime fees, Mother's going to tell you, charge a truck load of money for a one hour overtime. Do you know why? A you lot. You won't have an overtime. Huh? You won't have overtimes? No, you will. No, you want uh, the overtime fee, you want it to be really expensive. My attorney charges $400 an hour for his services. How often do you think I'm late for my appointment with him? Absolutely never. When I have to call him to ask for some advice, do you think I waste his time and I sit and talk about the weather and about his children and blah, 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 blah? No, I get down to business. I'm like, okay, blah, blah, blah. This will be, <laughs> okay, uh, I need this. Okay, 30 seconds, I'm off that phone, right? Okay, so the moral of the story is, is you know, let's say that you had a seven-hour coverage or a five-hour wedding coverage and you had an hour of your overtime fee is only $25 an hour. See, that's no big deal. That's nothing. Your time is worth $25 an hour. How often do you think that client's going to be late if you charge $500 an hour? How much is your time worth? You see, if you have a healthy, very big chunk of money that is designated as an overtime fee, guess what? You have, you have gone light years from zero to 60. You are now a professional like my attorney. And I can promise you they do not waste your time if there's a big chunk, a, a big payment that would be paid for that hour overtime. Now, how do you think I would use that? Because I used to have hourly, you know, an overtime fee for, you know, in the past. And I can promise you, this is how I would use it. Let's say that, that it was time for me to turn into a pumpkin. I would go up to that client and I would say, hey, you know what, Mary and John, it's been such a delight with your wedding. I, this was such a beautiful experience. Um, you know, it's about that time for me to turn into a pumpkin. Is there anything you'd like me to do before I go? You know, uh, if you'd like me to stay an extra hour, you know, my overtime fee is five. Oh, yeah, with a stripe band, you know, your overtime fee is $500 an hour. Oh, my goodness. You know, and if I liked them, this is what I'd say. Say, you know what? I just like you kids so much. I'm going to give you a gift. I'm going to stay for one more hour. You see, if I gave them a gift and my overtime fee was $500 an hour, what have I just done? I just gave them $500. You see, how much is 25 bucks? You know, your overtime fee is 25 bucks. Eh. Big deal. So what? You see? So it's not, a, it's about perceived value again. It's absolutely about perceived value. And again, folks, you have got to remember that we are not selling eggs. We're not selling a carton of eggs. That this is our profession and that you have the choice to make yourself, to, to elevate your perceived value. You can elevate it or you can diminish it. And you can diminish it easily by the way that you conduct your business. And the more often you allow other people to drive your bus, and tell you how to conduct your business, you take yourself and you make yourself a servant. Because servants are dictated to, and servants are told when and where to go places, right? Employees are done that way. People that are professionals, the CEO of a company, you don't go bossing that CEO of that company around, right? And if you have a professional person that comes to your home to work on your house, or your electrician, even those guys make, you know, they make a very healthy profit and you're not gonna stand around chat with that guy. You want him to get busy and get the job done. So, I, I mean, I'm sorry, to, I know that I hate to make that such a lecture, but by George, I really want us to be able to be good professionals at our job because it is so much fun doing this for a living and having people pay you well. I mean, it just is, doesn't get any better than that. To live your dream is just, it just doesn't get any better. It's so wonderful. And we are in charge of that. And the, the thing that holds us back so many times, yes, we have tough economic times, but so many times we let that, we use those words, oh, well, there's tough economic times. And so we let that, that completely dictate the entire universe of the way we conduct business, when in reality, it doesn't have to be that way. Because my answer is, okay, are there still people driving Mercedes? Yeah. 
Are there still people buying um, Audis and um, Lexus? Yeah. Well, who, who's buying those cars? And why are they buying them? Don't they realize we're in a recession? I know, think about it. Because people buy products that they like, that are important to them. And I want them to feel that my products are really important to them and that they are willing to buy them in spite of what I charge, not because of what I charge. So, okay, sorry. Here, here, sister. All right, I have a question from, speaking of business, Leslie Lee Photo would like to know, would you suggest a photographer hire a manager if they're not good at the business side oh, of things? Oh, yes, in a minute. Hire a manager if you're not good at it. I'm not kidding you. That is such a great dollar spent. It is so phenomenal. I can be here only because I have brilliant people running my business that are handling my company and taking care of the phones and handling the responsibility of ordering product. And I, I could not come and do this kind of a thing at all if I was trying to do everything. And we can't do everything successfully. That's the thing. And, and, and modesty means knowing your limitations. And I know what my limitations are. So yes, I would hire a manager. And I'll tell you who makes really good managers. Mature women, older women that have, um, that are, uh, maybe their, their husbands are retired or their kids are grown. Many of those kind of women, they love organization and they want to get after it. Um, I had a gal who, was the, who ran my studio for a long time and just moved to Hawaii a couple of years ago. And she was, um, her husband, uh, you know, she was an executive's wife. She just needed something to keep her busy. She just couldn't stand being at home all day long and her kids were grown. And she loved running me around and bossing me around and, and handling my life. And it was awesome. So mature women, older women are fantastic workers that way. They're really good. So. Now, that would be someone I would think about. Even a, a mature retired woman um, would be an awesome person for running your business. It's great. So, so if you're not good at business, you would, you would suggest someone do that right off the Absolutely. bat? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, yep. This question is from Lynn Frodo, and here she says, every famous photographer seems to give the same message, I guess, about getting over your fears, and yet we are still afraid of doing it. What's the missing link in between? Uh, you know what Nike says? Just do it. I'm not kidding you. The difference between successful people and non-successful people is not, not how talented they are. It has nothing to do with talent, because I'm going to tell you, I'm not a talented photographer. I'm really not. I'm not joking you, and I'm not, I'm not trying, I'm, I'm, I'm seriously not, I'm not talented. I'm really a hard worker. I'm very hardworking, and I really don't ever let grass grow under my feet. I'm always trying to figure out where the next, what, where the next phase is. What do I want to do next? And that's how I keep my edge. It's not, I, I did not have the little, the little bird of paradise come and land on my shoulders. I wasn't one of those people who grew up being the little art, the art kid. I was the jelly fingers in my family, and I was not the, art, the artist in my family. But I just said, you know, I know that this is something that I can do. I just have to be, just put blinders on and just do it. Um, it sounds, it's actually very easy. The problem is, is that we, all of us, we allow ourselves to be our worst nightmare. And we also expect too much of ourselves right away. So we expect it to happen overnight. And success does not happen overnight. It took my first 10 years in business, I spent the entire first 10 years in business trying to be just like everybody else. And I was, it was a snoozerama, it was boring, and my work was so boring. If you saw some of my stuff in the beginning, you would die laughing. And it wasn't until I just finally said, I'm not going to pay attention to what my peers do, what photographers do in their business. I'm just going to pay attention to what I see in the pages of fashion magazine and brides magazines to get concepts for photography, to keep my work exciting and interesting first. And then I'm going to move forward and I'm, I'm going to take lots and lots of classes. And I take classes every single year. I never go without taking classes because the more that you hear something, the more that it can become your personal, your personal feelings. That's what they say, mother, repetition is the mother of retention. And so I take classes every single year from photographers whose work I admire. Um, I go to WPPI every single year. I would absolutely not miss that conference every year. I go to Skip Summer School every year, and, um, and I go to Photo Plus in New York as well. And these kinds of organizations, and of course, you know, the Creative Live experience, I mean, it doesn't get any more inexpensive, and what a quality education this is. So I think that we cannot educate ourselves enough. I think it's extremely important for us to be open-minded. And I think that's really one of the keys to our success, is to be open-minded and not try to, and, and not go, well, that doesn't apply to me, I'm not gonna do that. I don't wanna learn that. Uh, that's not gonna apply to me, I'm not gonna do that. I can't tell you how many times I've been teaching a workshop and somebody would come up to me and say, oh, you know, Bambi, you know, I, would, I was thinking about taking your class, but you're a wedding photographer, you know, and, and I only photograph children. 
And I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding. This is so ridiculous. So, you know, I say open your mind and learn lots of variety because, you know, because it's like, it's like a, you know, a salad, a fruit salad. You know, a fruit salad could be just full of apples. But that'd be such a boring salad, so why not enjoy it and make full of, you know, lots of different kinds of fruit and nuts and, and you know, and, and just, you know, and so just open your mind to lots of different things and then, you know, and then you can, and then they all start applying. It's funny how you can learn one concept and then it starts building on something else and I can be photographing a little child and I will learn a technique in photographing this little kid that I'll take to my next wedding and I'll do it on a bride and it'll go, oh my God, it works. Simon says, tilt your head like this for the bride. <laughs> Don't think I haven't done that. When you have somebody who's really seriously uptight, trust me, if you just tell a bride, say, Simon says, walk forward. You didn't do it, Simon says. I'm not kidding. She busts out laughing, and it's just a silly thing. So, Okay, we've kind of touched on this, but um, a guest in the chat room had asked, at what point did you feel that you went from being a good photographer to a great photographer, and why and how do you think that happened? I don't know because I'm not there yet. <laughs> I am serious as a heart attack. See, I'm not there yet. I'm really not. I, I, and I hope, you know, see, I just don't, I don't even think about that. I never pay attention to great, good, whatever that stuff means. I just know what makes me happy and what makes a client happy. Most importantly, that's all I care about. If my client is happy, I have done my job. So I, I, I don't think about terms of great, good, and all that. I just think that's embarrassing. I, I just don't go that route. I just don't, I don't want to be up there because if I'm up here, then I got to come down the other side and I don't want to be there. I'm, I'm still going up yet and I, I, I really am just a newbie. <laughs> I've just been shooting for 25 years, only 25 years. I'm, I still got another 25 or so to go. Of course, I might have to have my little walker by then, but. <laughs> <laughs> At least you'd have something to mount your camera to. I know, too. huh? That's right. That's exactly how I feel about it. I'd have something to mount my cameras on, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, in Inc. Inca has asked, uh, what is the best time to discuss the price with a new client? Oh, immediately. Uh, I want them from the first, from the, whenever I do my initial interview, that client knows um, as soon as we sit down and we're talking about their wedding and such, that interview, they will have my complete pricing. Um, I want them to have that information right away. I'm not a shy and embarrassed about my, what I charge. I'm proud of what I charge. I think, as I said, I think it is in her best interest to spend more to hire me. I believe that. I honestly believe that it's good for them. I think it's absolutely good for them because I can promise you the weddings that I've shot where I was not well compensated, I did not feel good about that. And you know, not just rich people spend a lot of money to hire photographers. One of my favorite clients I've ever had was this young couple. This young couple uh, sent me an email, this little gal. She sent me an email. She said, Dear Bambi, she says, I'd like to, um, to talk to you about, your, about photographing my wedding. Could you email me your prices? And I emailed her my prices. And please do not email me asking for me my prices, please. I hate that from photographers. So unless you want me to photograph your wedding, okay? So um, so at any rate, so I sent her my pricing and then she sent me an email back and she said, oh Bambi, she said, you're way out of my budget. She says, I'm so sorry. She says, I've got this other photographer who's willing to photograph my wedding for a third of what you're gonna charge and he's willing to give me four wedding albums and, and, and all the complete proofs and, and two family books as well and, and all this other stuff. And I sent her back a really nice email and I said, dear so-and-so, I said, Thank you so much for considering my services. You know, I really appreciate it. We all have a budget that we're working on. I do too. You know, my family and I are on a budget. I just have one question for you. If the photographer gives you four wedding albums and two family books and, and, and 2,000 proofs, but you don't like any of the pictures, will it matter? Think about it because it's what's on that paper that counts. It's not how many albums that person gets or how many proofs. It's what's on the paper, folks. And so she, she said, you know what? I'd like to come in and interview with you. So she came and interviewed with me. She did not buy my smallest coverage. She bought my middle package. She spent her entire wedding budget on my services. She had her wedding at a very, very, at, at a, a recreation hall, but she was thrilled to death because photography was extremely important to her. Uh, how hard do you think I worked for that client that weekend? How hard do you think I worked for her? I gave that gal everything I possibly could give and more. I would, of course, I do that with all my clients, but still, somebody you know that it really hurt for them to give you that, that it was really a stretch for their budget, budget let me tell you, I gave her everything I had and more. And if she had asked me to, to, to come the next day to give her, to do another session, I would have said, what time do you want me to be there? 
because she just she she expended for me. I would be have been happy to do that for her. So I really believe that um, it's important for us to, you know, to not become the purse police. Here you can take that one and write it down as Bambi's quote for the day. Don't make yourself the purse police. Who the heck do we think we are telling other people that they can't afford us? I mean, you know, come on, think about that. You know, you are not in charge of my purse, and I'm not in charge of yours. And my goal is just to make you is that obviously if I, instead of telling for me to figure out, I want to I want to help you to understand why you should try to figure out a way to hire me, you know. And I think it's, again, it's all in how you perceive, you look at things, and and I want them to I want to try to help clients to see why it is in their best interest, a good thing for them. Well, the features and benefits. Well, you know what? I'm not going to give you four albums full of pictures. But you know, every single picture you get, you are going to go so crazy about. You're going to want to plaster your walls with them. And guess what? Because you're going to get all of your high resolution digital files and all of the retouching has been done ahead of time, guess what? You can take and print your guts out. Go make your mother the biggest album known to man. But guess we, if we win and you win. All of us will win. Because I was really well paid to, to roll out of bed that day. I'm, I'm having dignity. I'm very well treated. I'm treated as, a, as an honored guest. And as someone that is as a respected vendor, not you know some some servant that you know that, that they're going to boss around and not have, take serious. Um, there's a question from Arlu, wanting to know what other photographers you were inspired by. I know you quoted Jerry, uh -huh. and it seems like photographers are really famous among other photographers. Yeah. But I'm just kind of wondering how much of your inspiration comes from other photographers versus it just comes out of you. Oh. I know it does not come from me at all. I'm not kidding you. I'm not everything I know. I'm not kidding you. I see. I told you I, I have an empty well underneath all of this, and I am inspired by lots of people and lots of stimuli. Um, photographers are some of them. Uh, Harrell, George Harrell in the 40s and 50s, I was absolutely amazing to me. Um, I love Scavulo. I, I absolutely crazy about Scavulo. But I'm also, but many of the photographic um, legends of today, I am crazy about Jerry Guionis. I think he is a brilliant photographer and one of my many heroes. Um, Yervon, it, there is just, he is just the most fabulous photographer. He's wonderful. Um, Joe Busink is another one who I think is, is one of my heroes. Um, you know, just there's a variety of individuals. Jim Garner is another one. Uh, Dawn Shields is one of my favorite photographers as well as another young woman. One of the things I love about Dawn is that she's only been photographing for about five years now, and she took my class five years ago. She's one of the people that I, I admire so much because she's one of those people who said, okay, Bambi, what do I need to do to, to, to work on my craft? And I gave her specific instructions. Okay, this is what you need to do. Do this, 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 and this, just like I've done for the last three days. She's one of the few people who said, okay, I'm going to do that, and she actually did it. She, she would send me an email every couple of months and say, okay, this, I did this. Oh, my goodness, this is actually working. And it's amazing. You can talk to an audience of seven or 8,000 or 10,000 people. Five people will actually take that information and take the steps that's necessary. And I hope those will be the people that are in this room today, that every one of you will take, that, um, will take it and say, you know what, this is what we need to do. And it's not just, it's not just me. It's all the other people that will come after me and, and that you'll be inspired through Creative Live and the many other um, wonderful heroes that are going to come and go, that are going to come through the, through the gates here. And you know, take one thing from each of us and put it and take it to the bank and then just do it. Just don't make excuses for failure. Just shut up and do it. That's all there is to it because, I mean, that's what's going to happen. And you just have to, you can't be, uh, it can't be instant gratification, though. You have to be patient and recognize it. It's not going to happen overnight. But you don't think about how long it takes. You don't think about it. It just happens. You know, and that, the thing is, you know, it's like waiting for, um, it's like waiting for Christmas. You know, people wait, and little kids wait and wait and wait and wait for Christmas to come, and it takes forever, and yet then finally it's here once a year. So the moral of the story is, is that if you keep trying to look for it to happen, it's not going to happen. So just be focused on where you have to go and write down the steps that are necessary to do it, and then guess what? You'll turn around and you'll go, oh my goodness, what happened? Look where I'm at. Because you did focus and you got to business. I never pay attention to what other photographers, what they're doing and how I can be better than them. I don't, I, even though I'm highly competitive, I don't think about what they're doing. I don't try to m mimic their business model like the photographers in my town. I couldn't tell you if my life depended on what they charge. I have no clue. Because I just know where I'm going and I'm not worried about what other people are doing. I don't care about the negative noise. And if somebody says something bad about me, I just say, honey, stand in line. There's a whole lot of people behind you there. 
And you know, I think that's kind of the nature uh, that we have to think about is, is where we want to go, what we're going to do, and what are the five things that you learned and that you can take and you're gonna, what you're going to do with it. I say make a list and then take each one of those things. Don't do them all at once and say, okay, I'm going to say tomorrow morning, I'm going to practice this concept. Maybe for you it was the posing concept in, in relation to the light source. And so for, for an hour at your home tomorrow morning before you go to work, you're going to walk in your bathroom and you're going to go look in the mirror and you're going to go, okay, okay, look at me this way. And you're going to turn this way and you're going to say, okay, what did she say about pushing my hips? And you're going to practice that and practice that five times. And then you're going to walk to the front of your house or something and you're going to say, here, honey, come with me. I want, I want to take you to the front door. And I just want you to stand here for just a second. I want to find out where the light is. You're going to take your hand and hold it in front of your face, and you're going to start walking around the room. And you go, ah, oh, there it is. There's that light source. Okay, darling, come over here. Let me just look at it and see it on your face. Do I see it in your eyes? Because the more you physically do it and physically put yourself in that scene, the sooner that it's going to become second nature to you. And then when you get to your office for your regular day job, and I know that we have one of our gals here that delivers babies uh, or works in, a, in the delivery room, right, on a me. So you're going to be in that room and you're going to say, hey, as these babies are being born, where is the light falling on that baby's face, you know? <laughs> and, then, um, and then you're going to start taking neurochromes with your brain, even when you don't have a camera. You wouldn't believe how often that comes up. There are a lot of cameras in delivery rooms. And if it's not real busy, I'll say, here, do you want me to take your camera for you? And there I you go. Absolutely. So those are the ways that you grow. You absolutely, um, you absolutely make it happen. You set yourself a goal and you take each little step and you just shut up and you do it because when you do that, then you can move on to the next thing. You can't allow yourself to get sidetracked on the next thing until, you go, until you've done the first thing and you've mastered it. See, because then you have something to build on. As I said, I would walk around finding the light first. Find your light first, start learning that. You know, when you're sitting in your restaurant this evening and you're having that glass of wine, look where it's happening. Tomorrow when you check out of your hotels and you have to go that, down that elevator, think, well, if I had to shoot right here and now, where's my spot? And then those kind of things, start familiarizing yourself with that. And then you'd be surprised within a month, you have made certain, part, certain um, exercises second nature to you so that when you have a real event, a real family that you're photographing or a real wedding or a real portrait or whatever the case is, you know where you're going to go. You already have it planned and it's in the bag because you've already, you already know exactly what you're going to do. And then if you don't, if you're not a wedding photographer yet or you're not a portrait photographer yet, what do you do? I would go find somebody cute. Go find some, some folks and just say, hey, can I photograph you? And give them free pictures. Just say, look, I just want to, I need to practice this. I need a real body to do this on. Um, a great place to find um, dresses and stuff like that for props. Well, as if you can make your own dresses. Remember I showed you a little earlier today? See, I even showed you how to do that. Um, but if not, go to the Goodwill store and just go find one of those simple dresses. One of the things I did at the Goodwill store, they had this wedding gown that from the top, it was absolutely ugly up here, the real dress part. So, but I liked the, the, the train was actually really pretty. So I took the dress, flipped it upside down, took the train and wrapped it around the bride's the chest right here, locked it in the back and made a sheath out of it. Um, by the way, you can throw those, old, those dresses in the washing machine and wash them. I, I wash them all the time. Um, and so I, that's what I would do if I needed a, a bride to, to practice those concepts. Um, and so that's how I do that. When it comes to portrait, and just one more business thing, and then I'll, I'll shut up because I know we gotta, we're probably getting close you to You don't have work. to shut up, Bambi. Okay. You don't have to shut up. <laughs> for, uh, for portraits, for those of you that are doing portrait events and stuff, I'm going to tell you a wonderful, wonderful little trick. And this, again, is under the cone of silence for all of us people, okay? We aren't going to share this with the universe. Um, this is one of the things I love doing. Um, I love uh, med spas and hair salons, and I think I told you that I work with a local hair salon in my community, and we, we, we get together every six or eight weeks. Well, those are great people to network with because they're women who are people that have disposable income, people that are interested in having their hair done or in, in facial injections and chemical peels and stuff like that. They tend to spend a little bit more of their disposable income on pictures and such. That's the kind of client I want. So I make those people my best friends. I want them to, and I, I really feel that they are really very good friends. And it's interesting, I want to work with local businesses. And I think that so many times we forget about the importance of local business. Well, that's who we are, we're a local business. We're a little local business. And so learn to make those individuals your friends and, and, and start networking with them and do things for them that, that make yourself valuable. You know, the thing I've discovered about um, local vendors like many of the hotels and the, the catering managers and such, they do not recommend the best photographers. They recommend the easiest photographers to work with. 
and the people that make their life simple. They so do not care whether you have won every award known to man. They care about whether you make that food cold in the reception room because you felt it was your duty, that this was your moment in the sun, and you had that bride and groom out in that lobby doing pictures for an hour and a half while their guests are in that reception room, and there's no food in there, and the food is getting cold. Tr t trust me, they do not like you, and they won't refer you. I don't care how beautiful your pictures are. So you want those people to be your friends, so make it easy for them to be your friends. And, make it, and remember that they have a job to do as well, and that world does not revolve around us. It doesn't. So, okay. Mammy, I, mean, I just want to say all of, all of the information you just gave us, you know, there's probably so many people watching this that are maybe thinking about taking the risk of stepping out and doing this for the first mm -hmm. time. And so it's just amazing to hear you talk about all of these things and giving them inspiration of what to do next, like what the first steps are for, the, for people that are watching at home. So that's what this kind of workshop's all about. It sure is. So and we appreciate it. You know, and I really appreciate that as well, because, you know, that I wouldn't be here today if, if it weren't for the fact that I had other people helping me out along <laughs> the way. And, and, you know, the fact that this has been a free program for the last three days, what a fabulous, fabulous gift it is from Creative Live. And, you know, I mean, I absolutely cannot believe that they put so much effort ahead of time into such a program. It's not halfway done. I mean, it, how many people are involved in this company? Actual employees? Five, yeah. There's five employees. <laughs> hey, you volunteers? <laughs> yeah, there, many, yeah, there's many, five many. employees, but how many, many volunteers? Many. There's 35 people on set today. Some of them are volunteers, camera between the camera people and, and the people who actually work at Creative Live. The funny part is, is that this, this is funny. They don't have any old people that work here, <laughs> which is funny. You know, they're all well, John. But see, you're young. <laughs> yeah. So, but a lot of a lot of folks that work here that uh, put forth an enormous amount of effort and um, and see, and that's the kind of spirit that I like because you see, they just did it. You know, and I think that's the same kind of spirit that I have that I'm sure every one of you had, and that's why you're in this room today, because when you were asked about doing the video, every single one of you said, okay, I'm going to do it. Who knows? It could be me. And who, who knew? I mean, you know, the monkeys, what is the name of your company? Light monkeys. Light monkeys, yeah. You know, and, but every one of you had the cutest little videos, but that would have, you would have not been sitting in this room if you had not taken that step and made your videos funny and made them interesting and, and just put yourself out there. And that's why every one of you in this room are going to be people that are movers and shakers. In my opinion, I think that it is a done deal. I just don't know when. Because you were the ones who got off your butts and just did it. How many people, you know, it just cracks me up how many people, few people actually take advantage of programs like that. So the next time you have a creative live event, I hope that every one of you guys will get after it and do those videos because I'll tell you, this is a really cool place to be. Thank you, Bambi Cantrell. Bambi, we just want to give you a huge round of applause Thank you. from around the world. Really, from, from around the world. Good. OK. Well, we have, um, are we going to say our thank yous? We are going to say our thank yous. Can I come join you? Yes. And don't go away, folks. We have a little surprise for you, so. Not just it's a little surprise. I know. Big surprise. It's a big one. You want to hunker down with me here? Yes, I'm going to sit down yeah, and hunker down with you. There we are. Bambi, holy cow. Oh my goodness. It's, it's so much fun watching the chat rooms just explode. There's, someone said, Bambi needs to write a book with all the unanswered questions written Actually, in the chat a rooms. Idea. It's a great idea. And we get 15% commission off that book. <laughs> just saying. There you go. Right, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, good. Moving on then. We have a couple thank yous uh, that we want to give out. As we said, we have a, a nice little treat coming up for you soon, but we want to make sure we thank everyone that needs to be thanked before we move on to that. First and foremost, Bambi Cantrell, thank you so much for coming here and just teaching such a fabulous workshop, so much information. You're such a delight. She is a delightful person too. I mean, sometimes you meet people or you see people or you, you know, just brush up with them. And they're like, oh, they're probably total diva off screen. She <laughs> was so easygoing, just every, all the art department, all the models. She's like, whatever. You know, you, I mean, she'd give me ideas. She's like, but if you don't, if you give me students or if you give me nothing, I'll work with it. And it's like, oh my gosh, you were just such a delight to work with. So thank you. Thank you. And, um, and in, in so, <laughs> thank you. 
And she also donated a number of the swag giveaways that you guys won. She gave out the cue cards, which are beautiful. Those are really fun to flip through. I'm um, sure you talked a little bit about those, the photo actions and the instructional DVDs. So thank you so much for giving those out to us. Um, next up, B&H Photo. Oh my goodness, we would not be able to do what we did if it, if it was not for them. Thank you, B&H Photo. Um, please support us and support them. If you're going to make any B&H purchases, you can go to our affiliate link down here, bhphotovideo.com forward slash creative live dot com. Um, <laughs> I have, I have um, the pleasure of having Adam, our technical director, in my ear at all times. I'm going to go ahead and take that <laughs> out. <laughs> Such a smart Alec. Anyway, so B and H, thank you so much. They've they've really made this this workshop and all workshops possible with all of their enormous support. So thank you B and H Photo. We hope you support them too. Um, we have a lot of giveaway giveaways this weekend. Boda bag donated a lot of stuff. Um, Lexar donated some compact flashcards. We had PWD Labs uh, do the post processing credit of three hundred fifty dollars. Um, skip summer school registration, another nice value of three hundred dollars. Your Vont Photoshop actions trio pack. Um, big thank you to Junebug Weddings. They helped us try and get some um, brides in here, some beautiful brides for models. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, Glaziers is our, our neighbors down the street here who hook us up with gear when we need it last minute. Um, we get all of our stuff from, from B&H, but every once in a while, you know how that goes, the day before or you know, 30 minutes, we don't have this, and we run down to Glaziers and they hook us up. So if you're here in Seattle, check them out. Uh, next up. Jerry Gijones, <laughs> he uh, hooked us up with a one-year membership to the Ice Society. Thank you, Jerry. Didn't he also, he is also giving a special discount for those that want to, um, for, for anyone else that's interested in joining the Ice Society um, as well. So if you go to the Ice Society, um, I can't remember what the code is, but if you send me an email at Bambi at CantrellPortrait.com, I'll look up Jerry, the one, the code for it, and you get a 20% or something like that discount. So. Uh, well, we'll see if we can get that in the chat rooms, too, so okay, you guys great. can know what we're talking about. Uh, big thanks to Nick Software, Kubota Image Tools, Triple Scoop Music. They all gave away some great prizes. And, of course, the Handy Porter Case. Thank you so much, all of you, for helping us out here. Um, we, do we have anything else, or are we, we're good to move on? So, again, Bambi, thank you so much. We're going to take a 15-minute break, and we're going to move. Hold on. Tell us. Nope, please, sorry. Please. Can we just um, say that we'd like people to shout out their thanks to Bambi? And we have a hashtag, Bambi Thanks. So why don't you uh, give a shout out? Because and we'll really, the, the world is thanking you. So. Show Bambi some love. Show Bambi some love. Thank you. All right. Um, but do not leave. We have don't got leave. something really cool for you guys coming up. You cannot go away, or you're gonna you're gonna miss the best part of the day. And also, feel free to give some love to the to our sponsors here. I mean, they they make it possible. So when you thank them, they know that it's it's worth their while to continue doing this and continue giving you free swag and hooking us up with good deals. So. Thank them and thank you. We'll see you in about 15 minutes. Great. All right.